Okay, so I think we should start sharp, okay? So welcome everybody to this that is going to be probably the last colloquium of the year. I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Caio Licciardi to you. And uh, Professor Licciardi had uh, graduated from USP, did his PhD in University of Regina, and nowadays he's a research scientist at, at Snow Lab which is going to tell us everything about search for new physics at this very interesting lab. I want to, uh, without further ado, Kyle, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you, and thanks for coming. I know uh, this week is usually like past the last one of the semester, so, so thanks for, for being here. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about, you know, basically the, the, the work we do, or well, at least my group at Snow Lab, uh, a very, brief outline here, just covering uh, <clears throat> standard model. You guys are all familiar with that, for sure. <laughs> uh, but no, the idea is then to say how you go beyond the standard model, uh, then how Snow Lab fits in this uh, search, and you know, focusing then on physics of genome and how we, we search for physics beyond the standard model we've been known until this week. Uh, so here is the standard model. Um, no, this is a successful quantum field theory that describes very well, you know, in, in, quantitative, in quantitative terms, essentially all you know, observable you know, phenomena. Um, it unifies uh, matter in two types of particles, you know, quarks and leptons, so, so it's like a, a periodic table of particles here. Then it, it describes interactions in terms of gauge uh, particles or gauge bosons, the type of particle. Um, and it describes how particles acquire mass with the Higgs mechanism. Right? Um, I guess I was trying to summarize this uh, in, in simple terms, right? Or looking for the Lagrangian uh, online, and then I found this cup. I think it's a Poplar cup, uh, but that's basically showing what I wanted to show. You know, uh, the different, uh, let's say, components of the Lagrangian that goes to the standard model. Uh, first line going like just interactions, then the interactions with particles, so, so that's you know, a success of the, uh, of the standard model, right? This, this you know, I don't know, like three legs in a vertice you know, with you know, two particles uh, of matter and one of interaction. That's you know, essentially why I'm you know, <laughs> putting this in red, because I was just trying to mention this is where these guys enter. Uh, and then the, 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 the mass terms, right? Where then the Higgs boson comes in. I think there are like couplings and then mixing couplings, because you have all these. This a little bit. Yeah, sure. Okay, now I think this should be better. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, yeah okay, sorry. Um, yeah, and I, I wanted to say that it was largely driven by, by neutrino measurements, right? The development of the, uh, the standard model, in particular, the, the unification of the DNM and the weak forces. Uh, so some successes, just to say this is a very successful theory. Uh, I guess if you Google which are the successes of the standard model, you find like the vast majority of people think it's the prediction of the Higgs boson. Forget now when it was uh, confirmed, but I think it was you know, uh, 2012, uh, we had this you know, uh, plot from the Atlas group showing this you know, very, very tiny, but there, <laughs> little bump showing Higgs was around 125 GV. Uh, but you no, know, beyond that and before that, there were several precise measurements you know, to one part in trillion, one part in billion, that, that essentially, you know, a lot of numbers that agree between theory and measurements. Um, and I guess another one that is kind of uh, important for this talk is the uh, description of a beta decay. Uh, you no, know, it's long away, but it's still successful, uh, you know, where it describes, say, essentially, to have a, neut a neutron in your nucleus, right? Essentially, uh, a neutron here composed or consisting of three parts there. Um, that has, no, that's unstable, right? That can decay into a lower lab, energy level uh, nucleus. No, many things happening, like holding these <laughs> parts together into neutron, then eventually there's the emission of a W particle and then the electron and the, the anti-neutrino, right? Uh, and then the neutron becomes a proton. So, so that's basically how we understand the, the beta decay these days. It's a neutron going to a proton with the emission of electron and an anti-neutrino. And there, there are many other uh, successes of the standard model. So then, uh, now how do you go beyond the, the standard model? I mean, depending on your, your age, I mean, you may think that we already are beyond the standard model because you know, when I learned <laughs> the Lagrangian, we, we, we were setting neutrino masses to zero. That was one way 
to uh, come to this left-handed uh, theory. But now with the neutrino oscillation uh, measurements, right, uh, that started with the uh, problem of the uh, solar neutrino flux, right, because you know, we had this model for, for um, how the sun works, right, and we calculated the number of neutrinos produced, and when people were measuring this number you know, on Earth, then basically we're seeing a deft, right? Um, and there were several of these, and always a deft, because essentially we calculated a certain number of electron neutrinos, and we're measuring electron neutrinos, and we're seeing uh, fewer, right? Uh, then, you know, more and more became, uh, you know, there, there are several ideas there, but then more and more became obvious, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> Known that you know, we, uh, these electron neutrinos were essentially converting to other types of neutrinos, and that's where the Snow experiment you know, entered in the picture, because uh, like this was early 2000s. Uh, so this is the spokesperson of Snow that was awarded the, the Nobel Prize in 2015 with the spokesperson of Super K, and the idea of the Snow experiment was that they could measure uh, neutrino interactions using neutral currents. So basically, you couldn't distinguish the type of neutrino, but you could measure the total flux. You could also measure the charge current, right, with the creation of an electron. And that's, I think, their famous plot, right, where you plot the, uh, their measurement of the uh, neutrino uh, electron, electron neutrino flux versus the other two types, you know, tau and muons neutrino flux, right? So there's this big correlation uh, for the neutral current, right, neutral current being blue. The charge current is just a straight line because that's the number of electron neutrinos we're seeing. And then this band is the prediction by the solar model. And then you see that the total number of neutrinos was very well in agreement. And they can pinpoint exactly where like, the composition is by this uh, intersection between these bands. Uh, so then essentially, this is the, you know, proving that, you know, uh, that there is this conversion, that neutrino oscillations exist. And you know, their energy dependence for this oscillation that was measured by super K very well kind of points to the fact that neutrino have all the neutrinos have masses, right? Uh, so, so this is beyond the standard model, like the old standard model, <laughs> but it, it, it doesn't really modify in any substantial way. The only thing that it does, like, so if you bring back the equations from the standard model here, is just that the couplings for neutrinos aren't zero anymore, it's just number, but they look like uh, you know, the other couplings for other masses in quarks and leptons, right? Well, not the lepton ones because they don't have mixing, but, but no, I like the quark ones. Uh, so how then you go beyond B, right? Uh, so I guess in high energy physics, you know, that they're all measurements of large, uh, from large colliders that are, you know, there are groups here that are doing that. I, I don't know exactly the status of physics beyond the standard model in this area. But what I do, uh, what we do there is, 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 is looking for beyond the standard model in low energy physics, right? So low energy physics, we know processes very well. So if there is physics beyond the standard model in this region or in this region, um, it, it must be, you know, it must happen very rare, right? It must happen not, uh, no, uh, not very often, otherwise we'd have seen it, right? So it must be rare, you know, in a way that hasn't yet been uh, observed. So there are two, you know, uh, essentially strong candidates, right? So dark matter, you no, know, so this is a matter we have evidence through gravitational uh, observations. Um, no, so if we find dark matter, there will be another field here, and I don't know how this would change in terms of adding more terms for the standard model, but definitely bringing a new particle you know, will, will modify the standard model as we know it. And then another idea is you know, now that neutrinos have mass, right, and you know, we know they don't have electric charge, we could, uh, <clears throat> we could hypothesize that it is uh, their own antiparticle. Right, because if you change you know, a charge variety, you no, know, we know it's not only left-handed anymore because it has masses. Uh, so that would bring a new type of vertex here. You no, know, in particular, we 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 know from these uh, two equations that every time you see you no know, a lepton, you no, know, in an interaction you have to have an, an anti-lepton in, in a way. So there is this conservation. You no, know, it, it's it's a symmetry of the model that we put in by hand. That doesn't matter what order you do your calculations for, for, for this Lagrangian, the, this, the symmetry is always conserved, right? So, so the number of leptons or the number of variants are, is always present. Uh, but if you have you know, a particle that's its own antiparticle, you break this, right? And then if you break this, it, it, it is modifying the standard model in, in a substantial way. 
So one way that is proposed to search for this violation is, is what is called the neutrinoless double beta decay, right? So that is essentially a double beta decay. So a double beta decay happens in any nucleus that uh, you can uh, have no, uh, a nucleus that if you have two double beta, sorry, if you have two beta decays, it goes to a lower level energy, right? Um, so nucleus, right, or nuclei that, that, that beta decays, this, this can happen, right? But since, um, no, <laughs> if you have, so here essentially I'm saying you, you have to have two, double, two beta decays at the same time. Um, so if, not all nucleus, you can have no two beta decays, but, but no, the ones with one beta decay, it can have two beta decays, but this is much rare, right? You're asking a nucleus to you know, decay twice about the same time. So, so this is very, very rare. Um, and so to see this, we have to go to nuclei that forbids you know, a single beta decay, because otherwise you just lost into a lot of the uh, beta decays. Uh, so, but this is well known. This is uh, seen in, in several nuclei, like xenon 136, uh, xenon, um, sorry, xenon 136, germanium 76. Uh, there, there are other candidates like tellurium 130. This is all already me measured and observed. The hypothetical decay is when you know, <laughs> uh, you, you essentially assume that neutrino is their own antiparticle. So the same neutrino that you see here in these two vertices, you no, know, it, it's the same, right? It participates in both of the vertices. Uh, so essentially, you, you switch the, the 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 direction of one of these arrows, and then it becomes a, a neutrino going backwards in time, more, more or less to say. And then what you have, you no, know, is, is an interaction of the type here on the with the right hand, where you have two neutrons in the nucleus, right, in the initial uh, state, and in the final state, you have the two protons. You don't, you don't really ever measure the, the, the energy of this recoil energy of the nucleus, uh, but you do measure the, the, the energy that is released by the electrons. Like even here, the neutrino energy, usually you don't see, but you always see the energy of the electrons. So, and then here you would see the two electrons coming out, right? So that, that's what it's called the neutrinoless double beta decay. You don't have any neutrino in the final state because it, uh, they both participate here in a way that they, they essentially is created and annihilated at the same uh, time. Right? Um, so, I mean, clearly you see two leptons in the, two, in the final state, no lepton in the initial state, so there is a break in the, uh, in the conservation of lepton number. Um, no, the frequency that this happens, right, it's controlled by the mass of the neutrino, so, so that would put constraints in the absolute scale of neutrino masses. We know neutrino have masses, but no, at this moment you only know mass differences. We don't know the actual scale where these masses are. We know they are very light, but, but we don't know much beyond that. Um, yeah, and you know, because you see creation of leptons, you know, it can help no, uh, explain why there's matter over antimatter in the universe, but it really depends on how frequent this happens. Maybe if it's really, really, really rare, that won't help. That, that won't explain all the matter we see in the universe, but it does help to explain. So how do we search for this? Like we can measure this. When we measure this, we see something like the beta decay. We see a spectrum that's continuous, you know, where the energy goes from zero to the decay energy, like the Q value. Right, so, so here is normalized by the Q value for whatever different energy for the different nuclides. Uh, and, and it continues because the two neutrinos are essentially stealing energy from, you know, from their measurement here. You only see electrons. So here there's no neutrino to steal energy, so you'd see you know, a, a sharp peak at the decay value. Right? So we search for a peak around the Q value of the... Uh, so, so basically you mount the factors that, that can double beta decay, that forbid single decays, no, Xenon 136, Germanium 76, Tellurium 130 are the most promising these days. Uh, they have technology that, that can probe you know, these days up to, like, so we're setting limits for this um, search of the order of 10 to 26 or 10 to 20, uh, 5, 26 years, you no, know, at 90% confidence level. Uh, but then the next generation, which we're calling the tone scale and uh, you see why generation will be setting limits at the 10 to 28 years, right? So these are the, 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 the candidate isotopes. Um, so, so that's how then underground physics comes about, because you, you see the, the, the half-life is very, very long. It's a very, very rare, like to the point where even if you have like 100 gram 
sorry, 100 kilograms are tone scale detectors. You only see like a decay of these every year, right? So, so you really need to be clean of anything else. Otherwise, you'll be losing this one count versus you know, 10 of back sounds, right? So here I'm just showing you know, why it's important to go underground. Like, so you know, something that can blind your detector are you know, neons that are traversing you know, uh, the surface. You know, so at sea level, you know, in average, you have about one neon per centimeter square you know, per minute. Uh, so if you take a detector, you know, usually these detectors are of the order of you know, one square meter, right? you would get about you know, half neons per second. No, and basically that's about the zero time of your detector. Usually when you see a, a, a muon, you essentially don't consider anything around the time of the muon passing and, and you know, some second around it. So essentially, if you put a detector on surface, you don't, you know, you, you can't measure anything. Right? So you, you're blinded by the muon. So then you go underground, and then you see that the muon flux you know, is, is largely reduced. So, so here are a few different you know, underground labs Though here it's deep underground labs you know, in Europe or outside Europe. Uh, so here, essentially, I wanted to show that you know, Snow Lab is one of the largest with muon flux because it's the deepest one, right? Uh, Jinping is not so deep, but it's below a mountain, right, or a hill, so, so you have more you know, muon attenuation. Yeah, so, so that's then when Snow Lab comes in. <laughs> so Snow Lab is in Sudbury, you know, Canada. Uh, it, it's two kilometers underground of a rock mine. It's a valleys mine that explores uh, nickel. Uh, today, we have about 5,000 square meters uh, of area. Uh, so, so this is after expanding, and I'll show a, a map in the next slide. No, it's no lab is operated by, by five universities, but no, uh, other universities can use it if the physics connected, related, and, and there's opportunity to connect. Uh, because this lab is funded by, 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 by the Canada Foundation of Foreign Innovation, so it's not funded by the university. Yeah, so I wanted to show a, a quick video of what Snow Lab is for those that are not familiar. But you know. And you know, I tried to put this in my um, slide, but it didn't work, so I have this open here. So this is the uh, surface uh, lab. It sits on the valley mine, right on top of the valley mine. Uh, it's, yeah, so it's going. Yeah, so I'm just gonna read very quickly here. So usually the shaft that goes down is only at 6 a.m., right? Uh, so you have to be ready uh, in front at 6 a.m., and then you go two kilometers, six to 800 uh, feet uh, underground. There's a 1.4 kilometer, so it's essentially one kilometer. You have to walk through the mine to get to the lab in mine gears, right? So then when you get there, you're very dirty. You just clean boots. Um, there are lots of particulates that can you know, be trapped in your hair, no face. So, so you take a shower uh, before getting into the lab. So usually radon is a very bad contaminant underground. Then once you take shower, you no know, no lab provides all the gears, the lab gears you need, like all PPEs and stuff. It's all, all for clean room. So, so there are hats, uh, glasses, uh, you know, everything. Uh, it's just by the, the, the so there, there, there's a place where you can have coffee. There, there's no cafeteria that you can buy. So, so you have to bring all your lunch food for the day. Uh, then you put your gears on for the lab and you go work. So I think they're showing the car wash region. It's where you ship equipment underground. That's where you go find them. Before you took it, take them into the lab, you have to do cleaning, right? So, so everything is clean. Everything is double bagged. Uh, so, so it's no, the least possible contamination. Um, so it's showing some places there. So, so this is the Snow Plus uh, control room. It's the same control room of the Snow experiment. Um, so so it's, it's still the same event display and everything. They just changed the, the purpose of the experiment. Um, if you want to go on top of the, 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 the ball where the, the water is, is in the Snow Plus, then you have to do this uh, air shower. No, this is the, uh, all the ma machinery for the ultra purification of the water. That, that was the, you know, the nice feature of the uh, snow experiment. That's how they managed to get precise measurements. So now the lab is bigger and has other experiments like the, 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 these are searching for dark matter. So, so there, there are different technologies searching for dark matter. So the you know, cute um, uses crystals. Um, I forget the name of the other ones. I think it was Pico. Pico is a bubble uh, superheated liquid. 
but there are also other experiments in SnowLab. Like that student is a medical physicist student, so they do experiments with flies to see how long flies survive, you know, between surface and underground. There's another dark matter experiment using liquid argon, PT 3600, produces by six. This is a not very successful experiment called MiniClean. It's supposed to use uh, liquid uh, neon, but it didn't work out. Yeah, so I guess they, they only show these because these are the most, uh, like, the, the active uh, experiments these days. Yeah, and then just putting, you know, uh, mining gears on again and, and going home. Yeah, so then usually you go out uh, to the surface again about 2.30 some days, 4.30 other days, and 6.30 other days. So there are days you spend... 12 hours underground. It's really, Valley uh, is very uh, supportive of the project, but they only offer one shaft down and one shaft up every day. So, so you need to be, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can't miss that one, yes. <laughs> right, so. Um, Yeah, so this is the map of Snow Lab. So the initial snow cavern, where the, 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 the successful snow uh, experiment was, was just this, right? So they would go, so here is the mine. Like, so you go, I don't know if the shaft is really this or it's around here. And it, it used to be where you would enter here. Here was the cafeteria. They had the snow ball here and, and the water purification. But these days, they expanded the lab, this region. And in this expansion, they made two other large caverns or cavities, one that looks like a uh, cube, so it's called the cube hall, and that's where DIP 3600E that's showed there, like there, there's these you know, stairways and stuff. Uh, that's where Pico 500 wants to go, and NewsD is already installed. Uh, there is a tunnel that connects to the cryo pit, which is the other larger cavern, but the cryo pit, there's also, so there's one you know, tunnel that goes to the bottom of the cryo pit, and there is a tunnel that, you know, it's a it's kind of thin together here, but they aren't, right? So this is on top, and you end up on the top of the cryo pit. And cryo pit is a cavern that was built to uh, house a, a tone scale uh, neutrinoless double beta decay cert. They don't know which one is going to be yet because it depends on funding. But you know, um, the idea is that it was designed to be flooded. They, they knew it was going to be a, a, a cold experiment, like a cryogenic experiment. So it requires, say, a very cold liquid, uh, and no, I'll show you in a second, but the Nexo, right, and the other projects there, they, they, they usually have this large water tank to veto outside events. So if there is an accident, and it's uh, essentially you have water leaking, uh, they, the bottom exit uh, can be closed. It's easy that there's a, a, an exit, like an emergency exit for people. Uh, and you can close, it doesn't affect the lab, right? And there's also a top exit that, that no, if, if, even if it's flooded, it, it, it doesn't no, reach that level. Uh, but it doesn't affect the lab at all. So it's at the one corner where you can close, it doesn't affect ventilation or any other of the uh, no needs of the lab. So that's where we, we, we are proposing to build Nexo. Um, so the idea is, is an experiment to search for neutrinoless double beta decay using Xeno 136, limit, uh, liquid Xeno 136. Uh, I just show you here the, uh, let's say, the design of this project inside the cryo pit. So see, it's this car burning where you have essentially a, a cylinder and a dome, right? The nice thing about the dome is that you can walk in and work in other sectors. So the idea is that we, we would place like a water tank. Then there are two cryostats, one essentially holding vacuum. So it's a thermal insulation. Another one that holds a liquid, uh, no, uh, uh, sorry, a, a, a cooling liquid. We usually use HFC, but it's essentially what keeps the xenon in the liquid state. So it's essentially at minus 100 degrees uh, Celsius. Um, and then essentially uh, we would have a way of going from the top here, kind of close to the detector. And if you need, you can open and do maintenance from the top here, right? Uh, Okay, so Nexo is rooted in the success of the Exo 200. So Exo 200, I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little more and explain. So this is the existing slash past generation because we stopped taking data in 2019. Uh, the idea of Exo 200 uh, was you know, to test this technology of liquid xenon to search for neutrinoless double-building At the time, we had not seen yet even 
no uh, neutrino, uh, sorry, double beta decay with two neutrinos in general relativity. No, exo 200 was the first one to do this measurement. Um, so exo 200 is, is essentially a, a vessel, right? Uh, this is the schematics. Um, it was located in, in another lab. No, it is a lab in, in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Uh, so it's a, a salt mine. Uh, it was much more shallow, you know, actually, if you remember, but in that plot I showed all the mine. WIP is one of the shallowest, right? It's only 650 meters underground. Um, the idea is we, we, we have this vessel with liquid xenon. In the middle, we place a cathode where we apply high voltage. Now, at the end, we have you no know, crossed wires you know, that essentially acts as the anode. And on the back of these wires, we have photosensor. So if there's an interaction uh, in the liquid xenon, say the, 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 the double beta decay, so it has two electrons, you know, uh, going or uh, traversing liquid xenon, they only go for about two millimeters, but they excite a cloud of electrons around the xenon that then, you know, some recombine and emit UV light that are, detector in, that are detected in the photosensors. The remaining that are not recombined, then they are pulled by the electric field, right? You apply a high voltage, so you create a constant electric field you know, between the, the cathodes and these uh, wires. So you pull these electrons, uh, and then you measure in two directions, right? So there are two crossed you know, um, planes of wires. Uh, so you get 2D information plus you know, the time it takes to travel, because you know, we have you know, a trigger time that's the UV light collected by the photosensor that's of the order of nanoseconds. Our electronics is of the order of microseconds, right? So, so in nanoseconds, the UV light reaches the photosensor, it triggers the event, and then a few microseconds later, then you get you know, the timing of the electrons. It, it gives you, because it's a constant electric field, it gives you the time it took, so, so you get the longitudinal coordinate. Uh, so that's how the, the liquid xenon TPC works. No? Um, we took dating exo 200 in two phases because there was an accident in the mine that, that stopped operations between 2014 and 2016. Uh, but essentially, you roughly took about the same amount of data in each phase, so, so it's nice to compare. And in the end, you observed about 60,000, uh, about, right, a, a little more maybe, 60,000 uh, observed uh, two new events, uh, sorry, double beta decays with, with two, two neutrinos, right? You call it two new events. So these are the final results. I won't go in details of the analysis because I just want to give you an idea of you know, where we are at with the research. So this is the final results of the EXO 200. What I'm showing here is just you know, a selection of events that look like double beta decays. Uh, in phase one and phase two, you know, these are their energies, right? And here are essentially the 60,000 I told you. So, so essentially everything that is in gray, right, all, all, about all the points except for this bump. This bump we know comes from potassium 40, are the double beta decays. And then when you look just around this region here, around where the Q value is for the Xeno-136, which is no 2.4 MeV, that's where then you do this inset figure. Then you look at the events there, so we only count a total of, what was it, uh, 65 events in data, right? But it, we were expecting this region, like the, the peaks, uh, about 62, 63 events, right? So, so the, the, you know, there's a big Poisson you know, fluctuation, so it's really consistent with no excess. You know, uh, so the limits we place in neutrinos double beta decay with exo 200 is of the order of 3.5 times 10 to 25. The sensitivity is about the same. Um, there is an effective neutrino mass that mediates this process, right, that I show in that um, no, diagram. Uh, that you no know, effective neutrino mass, we can put a limit there uh, uh, between 93 and 286. This range is because of uncertainties in the you know, model to convert from half-life to neutrino mass, right? So there is this nuclear matrix element that we don't know very well how to calculate. There are different approaches, and the different approach gives us about this you know, three times or four times difference there. But that's essentially, you no, know, there are more sensitive detectors like Kamlan Zane. Uh, but they're also in this region, right? They aren't much below, you know, you know, 50, 60 MeV. So that's where we are at in this search. So what we are doing EXO 200 these days is, you no, know, uh, uh, like we applied machine learning, deep learning techniques to identify types of events. You know, but now I'm more interested in applying this deep learning to reconstruct uh, events, you know, at lower levels in the sense that, you no, know, looking at the spatial coordinates. Right, so, so here I'm showing no, so this is uh, the work of a, a student, you know, uh, in, in Inter. 
So he was looking at, say, if you have a single energy deposit in the detector that happens around, you know, in the projection of the wires here, this is how our detector would respond. So that's our electronics, essentially. You know, V wires are the planes in the front. U wires are the back planes. V wires are induction planes, so, so they are shape, like the waveform shape is a little different than the collection ones. But the idea is we can simulate these uh, traces, right? We, we, we do simulation in exo 200 down to the electronics level. So we can make a lot of simulations and then we can do some supervised learning and then say, well, if I see these, uh, I know what is my X, Y, and Z. And then you train our network and then you ask back, you know, and then you, you know, pass a, a test set and see how well you do. And actually it performs much better than the standard reconstruction tools, right? So here is just a one sample, um, you know, uh, result plot where we're looking at the resolution along the U wires, right? Um, and then in, in, in orange and yellowish here is the standard reconstruction tools where essentially we're doing some sort of, a, <laughs> no, something simpler, right? Where, no, depending on the position of these uh, U wire, no, you only see this one peak here, then it's more or less around that, right? Uh, it's a little more robust than that, but, but that's essentially what the standard reconstruction tool does versus the deep learning technique that gives us this, this, this blue histogram that's a lot more Gaussian because it doesn't have these, um, well, the, it's more Gaussian because it actually, when you do these type of you know, simulations, there are inductions in neighboring wires that we're not considering the standard reconstruction tool that the, the deep learning picks up you know, by free essentially, right? It, it understands if there's some small induction uh, on one, say, neighboring wire here, that's larger than the induction on the other neighboring wire, it actually places you know, the position more towards one or the other neighbor. So with that, we get something that is, you know, the resolution looks more Gaussian and the resolution in terms of millimeters also uh, outperforms by, by, by a large extent the standard tool. Right? So here, uh, the standard tool was were giving us about 1.8 millimeters of resolution and the deep learning was give, is giving us 0.7. And it gets better if you go to higher energy deposits, so, so this is a plot of the resolution versus the energy. So if you go down to the Q value energy, it actually is at 0.3 millimeters. So it's really, um, no, it's really an improvement, and it's essentially an improvement that comes about by free because you don't need to do all the development of a standard reconstruction tool. You just do a network that trains it, and then you, know, you get the, uh, the, the coordinates from it. Uh, what we want to do next is, no, we only did this, no, <laughs> single reconstructions uh, of coordinates so far, but the idea is we want to validate that this is work. So we only have you know, trained and tested in simulations, but we want to test this in data. So one way to test this is that our cathode has these, uh, say, there's these, uh, like, say, arms in the, uh, in the cathode, right, that are, it's essentially the cathode is this grid, right, but there's these arms, you know, those two parts for, for the cathode. And you can do a radiography of that, a self-radiography, where you select events near the uh, cathode, like here's only four millimeters. Essentially, you're, you're selecting on beta decays, right, so it's essentially like a radiography uh, with, with beta radiation, right. And we believe that if you apply the, uh, if you apply the, the reconstruction with, with deep learning, that the resolution will get better. So we're working on this, and then we want to extend it to multiple deposits reconstruction and testing multiple deposits reconstruction. So, so that's where you know, development for EXO200 is still uh, going, right? Uh, even though we finished physics analysis for neutrinos double beta decay, we're still using that data to develop stuff for NEXO. Right, so NEXO is then the next generation, because it's a version that's a bigger version of EXO200, but so EXO200 is a, it's 200 kilograms. No, NEXO would, uh, no, it's designed to have five tons, right? 5,000 kilograms. It's going to be uh, enriched in xenon 136, 90%, not 80%. So we gain another 10% in sensitivity there, but, but it is still being kind of uh, you know, finalized. The, the, the technology is slightly different where the photosensors are not at the back of wires. There's no wires because this detector is bigger, is 1.3 meters. It's, it's more difficult to hold wires this uh, long. Now, 40 centimeters like EXO200 is kind of easier. So they're putting tiles to detect charge and then tiles essentially you no know, are not transparent for the UV light. So you put the photosensors around the barrel uh, using a new technology of photosensor as IPMs, right? So now these days, Hamamatsu and FBK have developed IPMs with sensitivity for UV light and that can stay at, at you no know, freezing temperatures like 100 degrees Celsius. Um, 
So essentially, it's the same idea of the detector. The, 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 the resolution will get a little better because you have more light correction. Uh, where we are, <laughs> we're designing this, uh, and the projected results essentially comparing to EXO 200. So here's the limits. Uh, I showed like 93 to 293, essentially, MEV for EXO 200 was set. Now, NEXO no, is growing from like a 200 kilograms to five tons, but it's really gaining 250 times in sensitivity, and then it's pulling the mass, the effective mass limits down to like essentially hundreds MEV to tens of MEV. And that's sufficient to essentially explore you know, what's called inverted ordering of neutrino masses. So, so this is interesting because, you know, if, you no, know, I know it's not the case at the moment, but if, you no know, neutrino oscillation experiments point to inverted ordering and we don't see anything, that's a proof that, you no know, neutrinos are not Majorana, right? But, you no, know, if they, they, the, the neutrino uh, oscillations point to normal ordering, which is the scenario on the left here, and we don't see anything, all we can say is, you no, know, it's, it's still below that, right? But, but there could be something said in the next five to 10 years. Um, so, so that's why Nexo projects, uh, I won't cover much more Nexo. I wanted to say a few more words on the work my group does that goes beyond Nexo as well. Uh, now I work in Nexo, <laughs> so, so those results you know, I presented, I was involved in, in them all. But I, I do some you know, research you know, beyond Nexo, already thinking kind of ahead. And one of the things we can improve beyond Nexo is, so, so far we discriminate beta or double beta versus gammas essentially because gammas quantum scatter and leaves more than one deposit. So we do a selection of one deposit in the detector versus two or more. But we believe that we have you no know, sufficient resolution, we can even separate between one electron and two electrons, right? So say a beta decay and a double beta decay or a single quantum scattering and you know, a double beta decay. But what you need to get there is essentially get a spatial resolution of tens of micron, right? So, so our Charge detection so far, even in EXO, is of the order of, of six millimeters, so you can't do much better than that, right? But we believe that if you use SIPMs, right, uh, uh, no, with, with a resolution for, for no, a reading time of nanosecond, we, we, can, we can achieve 10 microns. So we have a setup in, in Carleton. We were just about to, to, to start running, but we do have some simulations of how, how it would respond. And, and that's what I'm showing here, you know, to, to a certain extent. I'm showing um, this here is just the, the projection on x, y, and, and y, z, or x, z, of a one electron traversing genome. Uh, you see it only goes like about one millimeter in each direction. Uh, but here is its you know, projection on the z axis of the you know, energy density, right, the energy deposits. And then one electron, you'd expect to see something like, I don't, it's not a straight line, but you'd still expect to see something like a Bragg's peak, right? Where you have you know, little deposit and then a region that have a blob. And two electrons, you expect to see that twice, like two blobs, right? So, so if you no, know, it happens to be in a way that you know, the electrons go different directions, you know, you'd see more clear these two blobs you know, versus the one blob of the one electron. So we're working on that. <laughs> uh, we, we have some simulations, we have a student now we're looking at doing the separation of simulation, and hopefully, you no, know, by, by mid next year, we, we, we can run these tests and, and see if you have real data with results. Okay. The other thing that I'm more involved is the Xenon Steel project, right? So the idea here is, <clears throat> uh, well, I'll, I'll, bet I'll start from the second paragraph here, but I was talking about <laughs> Nexo has five tons of enriched liquid xenon. So it's five tons of essentially xenon 136. But our worldwide production of xenon is 50 tons in the natural composition. The natural composition only has about 10% of xenon 136. So per year, we only extract from air about five tons. But even then, we don't get all the five tons from xenon 136. You only get about one ton know, from, from like very limited companies that do that. And, and it's primarily done by centrifugation. So essentially you centrifuge your xenon and then you take the, the side with, you know, that's heavier, right? But it's very costly because, you no, know, it's a lot of electric power. So what we are exploring here is, you know, how, like say, practical and, like say, you know, costly it would be to do cryogenic distillation where you do, you no know, enrichment of xenon. So here is focusing on the, you know, going from, production of one ton to maybe five tons per year 
know, using cryogenic distillation. Um, so distillation depends on a physical parameter that is called the vapor pressures. Like, so the, 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 more, you know, the more easiest to distill is you know, larger vapor pressure distance between the components. So if you do distillation of different substances, like components like, like, like you know, oil, you know, it's easier. But if you're only relying, you know, distillation relies on the difference in, in gravity, right? So different weights of the components. And then our weights are only different because of number of neutrons, right? So, so it's tiny differences, then, then the vapor pressure differences are very, very small. Yeah. So that's what you're looking at here. We had a column, like we built a column uh, in Carleton, like that was in 2019. That was only one, like say, module, and was two, essentially two meters high. And we did some results in the next uh, slide I'll show. But then we moved this to the cryo pit because the cryo pit's not being used, right? Like I said, it's depending on, on funding um, for, for, for the Neutrinos double WBK decay experiment, it's still depending, depending on, on, on funds announcement. So we, we, we installed in the cryo pit because we have access to the top and bottom very easily there, and we have about 15 meters high here. So we placed eight modules like that, so, so it's about 15 meters high. And we're doing measurements. This is active, ongoing. I have some initial results in the next, uh, in, the, in the final slide. But, but that's, that's another thing beyond Nexo, right? It's how to build something that's bigger than five tons of Xeno-136, right? So these are the results from Carleton. And I think it's very interesting because, you know, in literature, you find vapor pressure difference for argon. So these are all noble gases, right, or noble elements. For argon, you know, the vapor pressure difference between argon-40 and argon-36, and it's very small, but people were interested in this, I think, to build precise clocks or, or something like that in the past. So they did measurement for argon, krypton, and xenon. But argon and krypton, they did you no know, good measurement. Uh, so what we do is we use our column. Ah, actually, I did have a very quick <laughs> video of this thing running in Carleton. So, just very, so this is a bottle of liquid nitrogen. So we, we, we cryo pump uh, xenon here when we finish the measurement. Um, yeah, so here is the column. So here is where the boiler is of the, the, the distillation. There was one module. Here is where the cooler is. Uh, this is just a, a buffer bottle. Uh, so these are our controllers. We're, we're running at 76 stars, which is atmospheric pressure, and this is the computer that's taking data. So it's, it's not a very complicated uh, experiment, right? It's, it's actually, you no. Know, small, but, but it's difficult to keep the, the, the right temperature to do the, the distillation. So at the top, we have a fridge, like something that cools down, but you actually have to install a heater because that would cool too much, right? So, so then you have to play until you, between uh, heating and cooling until you get the right <laughs> you know, temperature that you can do the distillation. Anyway, so the process here, so the parameter that I, so essentially, okay, one thing is, we can then measure from this um, column we can sample top and bottom, like uh, the, 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 the gases that is distilling, uh, and you get a spectrum that looks like that. We, we have a, a mass spectrometer that is essentially a, a quadruple. Uh, so when we run with argon, we can see the isotopes of argon 36, 38, and 40. Uh, I think this is just a sample, right? Maybe top sample. Uh, for krypton, we see all the, the, the different peaks. And there's some overlapping. It, it doesn't really affect the measurement. Uh, we, we, we did analysis in, in several ways to see how this would affect, but it, it doesn't really affect anything substantial. What's more substantial here is, is so far is, is the statistical fluctuations. And then our result is plotted here in the black point compared to the um, no vapor pressure difference measure for argon 4036 in, in literature are the um, these diamonds, but are the empty diamonds. Our is the black one. And here it matches exactly the previous one because we use that to calibrate. So, so this is our calibration point. So um, Krypton, no, we have an assumption in our measurement. No, uh, so we calibrate the argon and we validate this assumption using Krypton. And the fact that our Krypton matches the previous, uh, oh, sorry, and the lines are the theoretical expectation, okay? Um, so the fact that Krypton matches the theoretical expectation and previous measurements essentially supports our assumption, uh, which I won't explain here because it's maybe too long. Uh, and then with this validation, we can assume now that measurement we do with xenon is, is valid, right? And our measurement with xenon, so here's the difference between xenon 130 and 136, is this black point, and this is the theoretical expectation, right? Uh, based on a model that has these points you know, uh, you know, in a sheet, right? So, so our agrees very well 
But the only measurement that was available in literature was this point that was not in agreement, right? So, so there was always this question whether was the theoretical model that was uh, faulty or, or is just the measurement that wasn't correct, right? And our measurement from Carlton supports that uh, the, the, the theoretical model was okay. Um, so these are the results from Carlton with this two meter high column. Can't see here, but this arrow bar is about 15%, right? And one thing I didn't say is, if you are to build a distillation column to produce three kilograms of xenon 136 you know, per day, you need one kilometer long. So it's really, really high, one kilometer long. Uh, so you don't want to have like 10% of errors here. You want to have something much smaller. And that's why we, we're running in, in, in Snow Lab. So initial results at Snow Lab is essentially just the argon run. So already, you know, we got by surprise because it takes very long time to stabilize the distillation. Right? So here is the, the, the enrichment of argon 36 versus hours. And what this is showing is that it's not a stable distillation until about 500 hours. 500 hours is about three weeks. And we were thinking when we designed this experiment that in a week we would be taking all the measurements because in Carleton at two meters, two meters high, we took all data in one day, right? So, but when you go 15 meters, it's really, really long. So, so it's very difficult to run experiments underground for so long without power outages or any other disturbances. So I think now we're all prepared, but it took us two years to get all prepared with all UPSs, systems, and everything automated. Uh, so we only managed to get this one run so far. We lost a Krypton run, we lost a Xenon run, uh, but now I, we, we think we're all prepared. But you now this would be a much more precise measurement because it's higher. We're doing more variations of the system to have more accurate systematic errors. And, and you know, because it's higher enrichment, you know, that also will bring the errors down. So that's where, where we are at in this, in this project. Uh, and that's basically what I do beyond that. So, <laughs> so just to conclude, um, we can search for new physics beyond the standard model, right, essentially via low energy events. But, but this will be very rare events. And that's where no lab comes about because it's an underground lab. It's you no know, ideal place to search for rare events. The focus of the lab is dark matter and neutrinos double beta decay. No, uh, Nexo is a neutrinos double beta decay search uh, project that is based on the Exo 200, successful Exo 200, and is projecting to be sensitive ten, down to 10 to 28 years of a half life. So it's a really, really rare. And um, no, now we're developing a, a lot of deep learning tools so that will be validated in Exo 200 and then used in Nexo. Uh, and then beyond Nexo, we already some, have some research going such as you know, discrimination, uh, improved discrimination of signal backgrounds and, um, and you know, ways to produce that much xenon you know, to be you know, of the order of tens of tones for further search. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much, Kyle, for this very interesting talk. I am really, really, really happy to have, uh, to have heard about this because I always wanted to see the gritty details on how to run these underground experiments. Mm -hmm. So let's take uh, questions from the audience. Yes. No, no, sorry. It's uh, 100 degrees Celsius, so it's 200. Yeah, that's, well... Yeah, sorry, there is a star. <laughs> it's an effective temperature. That then there is this, so, <laughs> there is this Leonard Jones coefficients that brings the, the boiling points to very similar uh, scale here. Sorry, uh, it is just a star. So it, it is a co correct temperature. It is, the cryogenic here is, is meaning that it is in liquid phase, these noble gases. So it's always of the order between 80 degrees to 120 degrees. Uh, minus 80 to, no, sorry, <laughs> 80, 80 kelvins, right, to, to 100 kelvins. What, what do you use, uh, uh, No, we have this fridge. It does, yeah, there, there's a, uh, this thing is black on the top. It can cool down about to 70s. It can go beyond that because I really wanted to do neon, but neon requires even cooler temperatures to be at the boiling point. But that fridge or, or no, 
sky cooler that doesn't know that doesn't have the power to bring it you know, below like so we run argon argon is the coldest one we run here and we run this between 80 and 85 kelvins yeah but it doesn't go to one kelvin yet that, that is very difficult here <laughs> yes Uh, uh, legend? No, uh, so there was Jerda. Yeah, yeah, I should put a plot from my background, uh, my backup slide. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, we, we, okay. <laughs> so what I would say is, Exo 200 stopped data taking in 2019, so we were not leading anymore for, for, for we never, we led just at one point, uh, and then the last result, at five, where is this? This last result at five ten twenty five, that was very competitive, but it was still below the, the leading, which was you no know, ten twenty six one point one ten times ten twenty six. No, that was Kamlan Zen, which was also xenon. Gerda is germanium. They have higher half life, but their uh, you no know, their uh, mass conversion is worse. Like their nuclear matrix elements don't doesn't convert to the same. No mass limits, so, so they lose on this, but they are of the order 1026, 1027 too. Uh, well, Jerda was 1026. Legends, no, they are now finishing building Legends 100, which is 100 kilograms of no, germanium crystal. Uh, but they haven't, I don't think they started running yet. And then they. Grand Sasso, or? Yeah, that I believe is in Gran Sasso, yeah. And then they have this proposed, like we have proposed Nexo, they have Legend 1000. Kamlan Zeng doesn't have much beyond what they have now because their technology won't go to, to tones <laughs> like ours. Um, but Legend has a thousand and it's very competitive in Nexo. They, they aren't different. I, in the end, they won't be different than that. It's just a different technology. And then for a while, you know, we were competing with DOE and other you know, uh, fund agencies uh, until last year when they have a review. It turned out that Legend won in every point but they don't recommend legend to be built alone. They want at least two technologies to be built, and they are planning three. You know, Tellurium-130 will be cupid, it's not as sensitive, legend and nexo. <laughs> so DOE said that they want both to be built, one in North America, one in Europe, but they don't have money to fund any of them. <laughs> so that's where the status is now. So now what we are doing, uh, no, I, I'm not sure <laughs> the name, yeah. Uh, but um, was a review specifically for neutrinos double beta decay experiments in July. And um, yeah, now so what the, the, both collaborations are doing now is they, we're looking into you know, international collaborations that could you know, maybe support more and then bring another. So what we requested from DOE was essentially $300 million, exact like legends, like about the same cost. And they don't, don't really have that much money. So what they're asking is to see what are you know, countries that can fund. So Canada is entering with some amount and they're asking more for Canada, China, uh, and, and see if you know, we can match some amount that they can then fund. So, so this is where this is, is, is going. But DOE has this you know, process of evolution of experiments. Like there's this CD0, CD1, so now both Legend and Nexo are in CD1. They, they have funds, right, to, to, to still fund R&D, but, but it's not you know, guaranteed that they will be building it. Yeah, so that's where they are. Mm -hmm. For the question to Kyle? Okay, I have one question as mm -hmm. well. But uh, so I, I work in the LHC and my particularly work in dark matter. One thing that drew my attention was the fact that you speak about uh, liquid argon only. Why? Yeah, ar no, xenon, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Liquid xenon. Why liquid only? Why not dual phase? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So <laughs> the technology we have here, uh, the, the CPC is, 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 is you know, liquid only because it works to this precision of millimeters, right? But that's, that's exactly what I'm, we're trying uh, in Carleton. This is dual phase, right? Ah, so, this is dual phase. Yeah, okay. so, but I mean, Nexo is designed to reach the sensitivity we'll have with, with single phase to the millimeter precision, right, or millimeter resolution. 
But if you go dual phase, we believe you can achieve tens of microns sure. if you install SIPM, because SIPM has a bunch of pixels, right? And then it has very you know, fine electronic resolution. Uh, so we're testing this, but it can't go to Nexo because Nexo is, you know, <laughs> to request funds, you have to be settled in this technology. And it, it's okay. I mean, if you were to apply this in Nexo, I, we, we maybe would go from like today is 1.35, 10 to 28. It would go from 1.35 to 1.7. It wouldn't go you know, substantially different. But you no, know, in the future, it, it is a possibility. Yes, it's oh, still open. Cool. But yeah, it's a good question because you no, know, it, 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 it does bring more spatial resolution. Okay, questions to Kyle? Dolly Uma, <laughs> Dolly Duas, Lindsay. Thank you very much, yeah, Kyle, you. for your talk. Thank you. uh,